Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. Well, in this video, I'm going to show you, because I made a comment a couple videos ago, how to make really delicious pork chops. In fact, pork chops that I prefer over any beef steak. And while the tops are cooking, I'm going to tell you a little story about harvesting corn on our farm. Do the two go together? Mm, I don't know. It's a rainy day, so I figured it was a good thing to do. These chops are stupid simple to make and you can do it on a gas grill too. I have a Weber with charcoal here because I prefer that. But you can do the same thing on a gas grill. You just want to get it good and hot. One of the keys is I brine the chops and see this is a gallon Ziploc bag and about three or four hours ago I filled the bag with a quart of water and one quarter cup of kosher salt and I put the chops in and I zipped it up so that the air is all out of it by squeezing the air out as I zipped it up put it in the fridge, let it go. Now I'm going to take them out of the brine and rinse them off in water. I'll be right back after I rinse them off. Okay, about the chops. These are chops from our heritage breed pigs and it's so much different than grocery store chops. A chop is not a chop. In other words, there's many different types of chop. This is a porterhouse chop, loin, tenderloin, just like a porterhouse steak with a T-bone in the middle. This is my favorite kind of chop. This is a rib chop, which is equivalent to a Delmonico steak or a ribeye steak because it's got this marbling in it. And this is the lowly, in my opinion, loin chop, which most people seem to want for some reason. It's just loin, loin on one side. This is the least preferred chop in my opinion, but it's the one we sell the most of. This is a hot fire. You want it just as hot as you can get it. Put the chops on the grill. Now, I time cook these, which means I don't check to see if they're done. I know by time, and I start the stopwatch on my phone, and at four and a half minutes, I'm going to flip them. And while these are cooking, we can sit a bit, and I'll tell you my story. When I was a kid in elementary school, my grandfather lived here, and he always planted 10 or 15 acres of corn. He had a little two-row planter, and our farm all H did all the work. The thing I remember most about corn on the farm is harvest time. Grandpa always harvested corn late in the fall when the ears were dry enough on the stalk to put in the corn crib. And he used a little one row corn picker drawn behind the H. And it was similar to the one in the photo here except the snout in back that dumped the ears into the wagon was straight back and the wagon trailed straight behind it. We didn't have a gravity wagon or anything to pull behind it. He just used a flat bottom wagon with some short sides built on it that were about a foot tall. The thing I remember most about him picking corn is the smell and the sound. The smell of those dry corn leaves in the fall weather and the sound, the crunch of the corn picker running. The other thing I remember is that the corn picker broke down quite a bit. That old corn picker had about a million of these chains on it that ran everything and inevitably they would break. Fortunately with these old chains you just kink them like this, drive it apart and then you can put in a repair link or shorten it a length. We were always working on the thing. After Grandpa had finished picking a load of corn, he would drive it up to our barns and our corn cribs and we would shovel it off the wagon with these shovels. And actually this is one of them we can use, used to use. You can see it's had a lot of wear. We called these corn shovels when we were shoveling corn, but we also called them coal shovels and scoop shovels. We hand shoveled all that corn off of the wagons and either into the corn crib or directly into the barn. In its heyday, our farm had upwards of two dozen different buildings on it. Blacksmith shop, carriage house, bank barn, hay barn, corn cribs, chicken coops. But the thing that I remember most about all of those buildings is the bank barn. And this barn had a ramp on one side made out of earth and stones you would drive up to onto the threshing floor. And then underneath that, accessible from grade or from the other side from the barnyard was the cattle portion of the barn with a milking parlor and horse stalls. Now I remember that bank barn so vividly I can remember the layout exactly in my mind even though I was just a little kid. The best memory is of the upstairs where you would walk in through the sliding doors and there was a big threshing floor where they would hand thresh wheat and other grains back in the old days. These barns were over a hundred years old when I was a kid. And then on the left hand side of the threshing floor was a hay mow 
where you would stack hay, had built-in ladders going up so you could get up to the top of the hay pile. And then directly under the hay mow were a set of chutes where you could buck those hay bales directly down into the horse pens and the cattle pens that were below. On the right hand side was a set of granaries where grain was stored and then the hammer mill sat next to those. Outside of this bank barn were a whole bunch of different corn cribs and all corn cribs are, are slatted wooden structures that you can put corn cobs in and the air circulation through the slats will keep them from molding up and you can store them that way until needed for consumption. I don't have any old pictures of the inside of that barn. Fortunately, we didn't take very many pictures back then, but the inside of it was like a cathedral. The way that the light would come in through the gaps in the boards and the small windows and sort of light all of this timber structure, hand-hewn str beams all pegged together. It was an amazing experience for me and the, the kind of peace of that place never leaves my mind. I'll never forget it. All right, four and a half minutes, let's turn them. Delicious. Grandpa's bringing up loads of corn one by one and we're hand shoveling them off the wagon and most of the corn would go into the corn cribs. But some of the corn, we, he would back the wagon directly onto the threshing floor in the barn and we would shovel the corn off into a big pile of ear corn next to the hammer mill. The corn that we'd put in the corn cribs that was still on the cob was used to feed to the pigs who would eat the corn kernels and leave the cobs behind. Well, sometimes they would eat the corn cobs too, but I remember lots of bare corn cobs in the pig pens. The corn that he piled on the threshing floor, we would run through the hammer mill to make grain for the cattle and for the chickens. And grain grinding days had their own sounds and smells and sights as well that are burned into my memory. Uh, Grandpa had the H tractor which he would pull up to the outside of the barn. There was a little hole in the side of the barn that a belt could go through and he would belt up the H on the big belt pulley on the side of the tractor, run that belt through the barn and connect it to the hammer mill and it was used to power the hammer mill. Once the hammer mill was running we would again using those shovels shovel the the corn into the feeder tray of the hammer mill, a big tray, and it would go down the slope and then into the hammer mill. And the hammer mill really was just like a set of hammers. It was a set of flails that flailed around and beat the corn into grain. And then the corn would blow up and into a drum and then down into a spot where you could hook a bag to it if you wanted to fill grain bags. We never did that. The grain would just come out and make a pile on the floor. The safety SAMs would have had fits over the way this was done. We didn't have hearing protection or respirators or anything like that. It was loud. When you fed a shovel full of corn into that hammer mill, it was deafening. And you'd hear that of the corn grinding up and the H laboring outside as the engine got bat bogged down by the load on it. And the, the air would be filled with white dust and you could barely see and your lungs would be filled with white dust and your nose and when you came out of the barn you were just white you were covered in all this corn dust I think most of it came from the cobs OSHA would not have approved but somehow my lungs and my hearing are fine some of my best memories of those old barns are playing in them when I was a kid. We actually had two big barns. There was the bank barn that I'm talking about, and then there was another barn that formed an L with it, which was on flat grade, and below that barn was all cattle pens, and then the above of that barn was all hay mow. Climbing around in all those structures, especially when there was hay in them, climbing the ladders up to the hay, making hay forts, uh, jumping into piles of hay down on the threshing floor, it was just amazing being able to climb around in all these old buildings. After we were done grinding the corn, we had this big pile again on the floor of ground grain. And then it was time to pick it up with the shovels again and put it in the granaries. And all they were were a couple rooms that were about 10 foot by 10 foot. And the wall next to the hammer mill was made up of boards that you could remove one by one. It's kind of like some of the composting uh, bins that people build, where as the pile got taller, you would just put boards in to stack up that fourth wall. 
and hold the grain. The interior of the grain bins, the granaries, was amazing because, of course, the barn was made out of wood and the rats chewed all kinds of holes through the walls to get through the corn. Well, my ancestors over the hundred years had patched up those holes one by one as they occurred. So the whole interior of the granaries were filled with flattened out tin cans with writing still on them, nailed to the wall, license plates, pieces of old roofing and machinery to make kind of a metal wall out of patchwork. It was a great collage. But we really couldn't keep the rats out of anything. I mean, everything was made out of wood. And the corn cribs, you know, they were just made out of wood and they had spaces this far apart between the slats. So the rats got in there and we had some awfully nice fat grain fed rats. They got their share, but we had enough even with what they consumed. So grandpa and I are shoveling the ear corn into the hammer mill to grind it up. And we'd start out with a big heaping pile of it. And grandpa had an old dog who was a retired police dog, a German shepherd named Mike. And Mike was a really good hunter. He would sit by that pile and grandpa and I would work at shoveling the corn away and the pile would get smaller and smaller. Well, rats lived in that pile. It was like rat nirvana living in the middle of the corn pile. As the pile got smaller, they had no place to hide anymore. So it was like rats escaping a sinking ship. One by one, as we took shovels out, they'd start dashing for cover in all directions. And Mike was right on it. He would catch those rats mid-flight and bite their heads off and then run on to the next one and catch it. And no rats survived an encounter with that dog. You know, I get these comments all the time and I do my fair amount of complaining about them from the people I call the efficiency elves that want to show me how to save lifting up a box or putting wheels on something or not dri having to drive the tractor an extra 100 yards. And I think back to that job that my grandfather and I did, just that one little job of doing corn where we shoveled it out of the wagon, we shoveled it off the threshing room floor and into the hammer mill, and we shoveled it from the hammer mill into the granary, or we shoveled it from the corn crib onto the threshing floor and all back through that process, and I think, oh my gosh, those guys would have had a fit. You know, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, hard work was part of the farm, and I actually take a lot of, uh, pleasure in how much easier things are here, that there's so much less work involved. And it's about as efficient as I want it to be compared to those old days. And as I said, doing corn was only one job. It, and it actually wasn't the worst job. Probably the worst job was having to shovel or fork the manure out of the barns because the spreader wouldn't go in those old bank barns. So we had to fork it, fork by fork, carry it through the barn, put it onto the manure spreader, haul it down the field and spread it, all hand work. And somehow we survived. In fact, my grandfather, when we were doing this work, was in his 70s and worked this way almost every day. These guys are ready. Then it's just time. They've cooked for about eight and a half minutes total. Pull them off. No need to check them. They're so juicy, the liquid floats on the top of them. Here's my favorite, the rib chop. And you can't overcook these. If they're a little bit pink in the middle, it's no big deal. They're fine. See how easy they cut? They're nice and tender. Tenderer than any steak, I think. And they are so delicious. Again, this is good meat, so you don't need to put anything on it. The brine that I use puts moisture into the meat. It's just osmosis. And, but there's no spice in it. There's nothing else in it. Plain meat is fine if it's good meat. It is delicious. I have a couple notes to finish up. These are three quarter inch thick chops, which I find cook the most moist because you can cook them so fast. And you can see, see how much juice is accumulated on the plate? That's awesome. We also do inch and a half thick chops and it's a different cooking process for those. Those you want to brine overnight, like 12 hours, to get the brine to really penetrate the meat and put more juice into the center of the meat. And then when you cook them, either on a gas grill or charcoal grill, four minutes on a side over direct heat, which is what I used for these, directly over the coals, and then move them over off of the coals into indirect heat or off to the other side of your gas grill. And they'll need to cook to 140 degrees in the center, 135 to 140, little pink isn't bad in the middle. And I use a probe thermometer to check when they're done. 20-25 minutes, they're done. That's my story and I'm going to go in to eat.
I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.